Okay, if members will resume their chairs. If members will resume, we will carry on with proceedings. And the next item of business is consideration of business motion 2827 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak button now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion 2827. Formally moved. Thank you. No one has asked to speak against the motion. I put the question to the Chamber. The question is that we agree motion 2827 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. There are four questions to be put in decision time today. I wish to remind members that if the amendment in the name of Jackson Carlow is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Lewis MacDonald falls. The first question is that amendment 2795.1 in the name of Jackson Carlow, which seeks to amend motion 2795 in the name of Fiona Hislop, on the implications for culture, creative industries and tourism following the EU referendum be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote uh, on the amendment in the name of Jackson Carlow is as follows. Yes, 29. No, 84. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 2795.2 in the name of Lewis MacDonald, who seeks to amend the, amend, amend the motion in the name of Fiona Hislop, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The next question is that motion 2795 in the name of Fiona Hislop as amended, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 2795 in the name of Fiona Hislop as amended is yes, 84, no, 29. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. Oh, so sorry, beg pardon. Sorry. The final question is that motion 2796 in the name of Alistair Allen on celebrating St Andrew's Day be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. That concludes decision time. And we'll now move to members business in the name of Rona Mackay. We'll just take a few minutes to move seats. The next item of business is a members deba business debate on motion 1537, the name of Rona Mackay, on men who have sex with men, blood donations. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. 
Would those members who wish to speak in the debate press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Rona Mackay to open the debate. Ms Mackay, seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted that for the first time we are debating this hugely important issue in the Chamber and I'm grateful for the great level of cross-party support my motion on men who have sex with men being treated equally in regard to blood donations has had. At our party's autumn conference, the First Minister said that the key message she wanted to promote above all else was inclusion. And that's exactly what my motion is about, equality and inclusion. Scotland has led the way on equality in recent years, and our party has an unblemished track record promoting equal rights. In 2005, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender was banned. In 2009, same-sex couples were allowed to adopt children, and in 2014, we legalised same-sex marriage. As the law stands, no men who have had sex with men in the previous 12 months, or women who have had sex with men who have had sex with men, may give blood within the 12 months deferral period. In my view, these rules are archaic and have their origins in the 1980s, when little was known of the risk of HIV, the modes of contracting it, and the prevalence within specific communities. Presiding officer, in the debate on adoption in the chamber last week, I spoke of close friends of mine who are in a same-sex marriage who have just gone through the adoption process. How will these men who are in a loving, monogamous relationship explain to their child why they're being treated differently when it comes to giving blood? Shockingly, if their child ever needed a blood transfusion and they were a match, they would not be allowed to save their own child's life in an emergency. In the name of equality, it's time to end this discriminatory process and base donor eligibility on risk, regardless of sexual orientation. The current rules around blood donation make no reference to someone's personal risk of being a carrier of HIV, and a promiscuous straight person would be able to donate blood, whilst a monogamous gay or bisexual man would not. I believe Scotland has a chance to address one major area where inequality still exists and at the same time address a chronic lack of uptake in blood donation and the coming forward of new donors to meet our demand for blood products. Over the last 10 years, there's been a 40% drop in the number of people giving blood and current figures suggest only 4% of people in the UK regularly donate. Yet 6,000 blood transfusions are needed in the UK every day. Stonewall Scotland believes that excluding thousands of gay and bisexual men who may safely be eligible to donate threatens the blood supply, which one in four people will rely on at some point in their life. The fact is that the breakdown of heterosexual people with HIV is rising, and the eligibility rules take no account of this. Also, the regulation on men who have sex with men donating is based on self-declaration, and it's incredibly simple to hide sexual activity in order to give blood. Of course, there must be stringent donor selection criteria aimed at protecting donors and recipients of blood transfusions. No one would ever argue otherwise, but I believe these should not be based on sexual orientation, but on participation in high-risk behaviour. The public need to have confidence in the transfusion system, and it's important to stress that all blood is screened at the highest level. That said, the statistics show that only one bag of blood has tested positive for HIV in the past four years. So that puts what we're talking about in some perspective. We need to introduce a non-discriminatory risk assessment policy that will judge each individual equally, whether they're straight, bisexual or gay. The current rules were put in place in 2011 after the Advisory Committee on the Safety of Blood Tissues and Organs, SABTO, undertook a review of donation rules. SABTO recommended a reduction of the lifetime ban to a one-year deferment for men who have sex with men, and this recommendation was accepted. Presiding officer, I believe Scotland needs to go further to ensure that all people can donate blood based on their personal risk of blood-borne virus transmission, not to their sexual orientation. Whilst matters relating to health are devolved to the Scottish Parliament, Policy relating to blood donation has so far been in line with approaches in England and Wales, following the guidance provided by SABTO. In June 2016 at Westminster, an all-party parliamentary group, APPG, on blood donation began an inquiry into the current rules. This debate is happening alongside a review by SABTO into the blood donor selection criteria. 
Stuart Macdonald, MP for Glasgow South, recently chaired an evidence session in Westminster on the issue, and they're due to make a recommendation early in 2017. The SNBTS could determine its own policies and restrictions for men who have sex with men, but it would be un un unlikely to be willing to implement a policy that was contrary to safety of blood tissues and organs evidence-based guidance. However, in 2011, the Northern Irish Government chose not to implement Savto's proposed change to the deferral criteria for this group and maintained a ban. Wales, England and Scotland all moved a 12-month deferral period after the last MSN sexual contact. Northern Ireland subsequently changed its criteria this year to fall into line with the rest of the United Kingdom, which I believe sets a precedent for autonomy. Presiding officer, to highlight this great anomaly, gay men can join the bone marrow register, donate organs and stem cells, and everyone goes through the same health and suitability checks. Your sexuality doesn't matter one bit. Whatever your age and whatever your health or sexual orientation, you can donate. Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Spain, Italy and Mexico are just some of the countries who accept eligible donations not based on sexual orientation. Spain has a deferral period of at least six months after a change of partner for both heterosexual and MSM, with permanent deferral for individuals with multiple sex partners. In Italy, a deferral of four months applies for people who have multiple partners who have had a change in regular partner. I believe that it should be possible to ask donors more detailed questions about their sexual activity rather than just whether they've had sex with another man in the past year, thereby gaining more accurate information on risk and making the blood supply safer, which is of paramount importance. Of course, the current law affects, also affects transgender people who want to donate blood, meaning that any man who transitioned to a woman is still classed as an MSN, and therefore not allowed to donate, even though it may have been a number of years since they last identified as being an MSM. I believe that lifting the ban on MSN donating blood and replacing it with a more equal non-discriminatory risk assessment is fairer, particularly since one in three 16 to 24 year olds do not identify as heterosexual. Presiding officer of the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service recently published a document with an updated position on gay blood donation. Within that document, it recognises the principles of kindness and mutual trust expected of all blood donors between the individual and the blood donation service. However, the mutual trust expected by the service is not reflected in the selection and deferral criteria, evident by the fact there is no consideration of the position of thousands of gay and bisexual men in committed relationships where the risk of HIV transmission is negligible. For the sake of equality, Scotland needs to go further to ensure that all people can donate blood based on their personal risk of bloodborne virus transmission, not their sexual orientation. We need to just introduce a non-discriminatory risk assessment policy that will judge each individual equally, whether they're straight, bisexual or gay. This would increase the number of much needed donors throughout Scotland. As I mentioned at the beginning of this speech, my motion is about equality and inclusion. And as my colleague Patrick Grady MP recently said at the first APPG blood donation meeting, for many gay men, a 12-month deferral is effectively a lifetime deferral. Even if we lowered the deferral period to a three-month deferral, this is without doubt a discriminatory measure on MSM couples in stable, loving relationships. Presiding officer, this is not equal or inclusive. I say let's go further Scotland, end this inequality now. Thank you. I call Christina McKelvey to be followed by Patrick Harvey, please. Christina McKelvey. Very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, we've moved a long way since homosexual relations between men over 21 and in private ceased to be illegal in 1967. You would think that by now being gay wouldn't be an issue. Like gender inequality, the very notion of homophobia ought to have fallen out of use by now. And I don't know why we find ourselves exposed to discrimination of any kind, wherever it's directed, but I recognise that it's still very much with us, as we were discussing just a few weeks ago in a debate here on hate crime. But when discrimination is actually built into the official system, we need to be very wary. And not long ago, as Rona um, Mackay said, you couldn't apply to adopt children if you were a gay couple. And thankfully, we've changed that. And the public good must always be linked to the human rights of any individual. 
Presiding officer, there are very solid clinical reasons why certain groups of people cannot give blood, though they could well become recipients of someone else's donation. Those with type 1 diabetes, for instance, controlled by insulin, can't donate, not because there is anything wrong with their blood, but because the blood donation service deems the risk too high for a potential donor. And there are some medications that will pre preclude you from giving blood certain blood conditions and a history of specific diseases that could potentially be passed on to a, a recipient. Those differentials are clear and widely accepted. We would be in a dangerous situation if clinical filtering mechanisms did not exist. Life events like birth, major RTAs and all of the diseases that we can now control and manage would become far more greater risks. That aside, critically, though these are decisions made on scientific grounds, not a result of some sort of irrational discrimination, they are, if you like, the outcomes of positive or rational discrimination. Blood donations must be safe, we all know that. Anyone can acquire a blood-borne virus or sexually transmitted disease, anyone. But some people have an increased risk of exposure and so may not be able to give blood or will be excluded for a certain period of time. And we've heard much of that in Rona Mackay's opening remarks. Presiding officer, it was revealed in June this year that UK blood is safer since the lifetime ban on gay men donating blood was changed in 2011. Safer. The Department of Health in England said, and I quote, surveillance data derived from the tests carried out in every blood donation in England, Scotland and Wales since the policy change shows that there are fewer infections are being detected in donated blood. Major HIV charities, including the Terence Higgins Trust, support the change from the total ban on MSN given blood to a 12-month exclusion period. Of course they do. But now we are seeing calls to revisit that, this exclusion, with SABTO, the, Scottish, uh, the, sorry, the Government Advisory Committee on Safety of Blood, Tissues and Organs, set up a working group in April to review the current donor acceptance criteria and look at any available new evidence. I support those calls. Stonewall has described the move as a step in the right direction and highlights that a risk that a high risk heterosexual would be less controlled than a low risk gay man in a monogamous relationship. So I hope that all of the organisations with an interest in ending this discrimination will work with SABTO and I hope SABTO will work with them to ensure that the policy and procedures maintain safety for all using transfusions and blood services irrespective of their sexual orientation. Presiding officer, HIV Scotland also tell us in their briefing that, and I quote too, every blood donation in Scotland is screened and tested for HIV and they're now very, very highly accurate. Also that men who have had sex with one man in the past 12 months is likely to be of a lower risk than many of those who are allowed already to donate blood, including men and women who have unprotected sex with different partners. Presiding officer, it's clearly time we moved on to the non-discriminatory risk assessments to end this inequality, and I support the motion in my friend's name and congratulate her for bringing this issue to the Chamber. Thank you very much, Ms McKelvey. Paul Patrick Harvey to be followed by Miles Briggs. Mr Harvey, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I also congratulate Ronan Mackay for bringing this motion to the Chamber for discussion this evening. It's pretty obvious, I think, to anybody that the primary objectives of the, the blood transfusion service should be to increase and to maximise the safety and the supply uh, of the blood that is needed uh, in our hospitals and medical services. But there is a good argument to say that the current irrational criteria that are being applied don't actually maximise safety or indeed supply. Additionally, there's an argument that applies to every aspect of our public services that any level of, dis uh, of discrimination or prejudice that's built into the way that they work uh, can uh, seek to, 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 to strengthen or to, to fail to challenge prejudice and discrimination in wider society. So there's a principled reason why all aspects of our public services have to avoid discrimination. But I think as well as that, on a third level, there's a case for saying that the discrimination itself undermines that, that first objective of maximising safety and supply. There'll be many people who might well be willing and able safely to donate blood, uh, which is needed in Scotland, uh, but, we, but who choose not to because of the way that they feel they're judged, because of the way they feel they might be spoken to, uh, or because of the questions they feel they may be asked that are inappropriate. And that doesn't just apply to gay or bisexual men or men who have sex with men. Because underlying some of these uh, criteria, these, in my view, quite irrational criteria that are being applied now, 
We also have to, to consider, for example, uh, trans or non-binary people uh, who being asked to explain whether they've had same-sex relationships in the last 12 months may feel that they're unable to give a straightforward answer that's both honest to themselves and giving the person asking uh, the information that's being sought. Maybe that they simply feel unwilling to be uh, categorized uh, in, a, in a binary sense uh, in, in being asked to, to give that information in the first place. The most important thing that we have to do to ensure safety of blood supply is testing. And testing is being done now to a far higher standard than it was in the past. Certainly to a far, far higher standard than was possible when the original criteria were set down. We also have to make sure that people feel that giving blood is something that is valued. And if some people are simply being told that they're not valued, or indeed that they have to tell lies in order to supply safe blood, which they know is safe, uh, then I think we're uh, undermining that second goal of increasing the supply of blood that's needed. I want to say something about these other aspects of the criteria which we're not talking about as well. The, the idea that any woman who has had sex with a man who has ever had sex with a man, or that someone who's had sex with someone who has ever had sex for money, how many people honestly could give a 100% guarantee that they know the correct answer to those questions? And so again, we're asking for information which people may, may not be able to give with 100% certainty, and which is not in fact needed to ensure 100% certainty of the safety of blood that's being donated. Uh, I'd like to close, Deputy Presiding Officer, by thanking, as I'm sure we all will, all of those many people who do donate blood uh, and the people who deliver that service uh, in communities up and down the country. It's a vital service. It's one that genuinely saves lives. And we should value everybody who chooses to donate blood uh, and to everybody who works to make sure that the supply of that blood is available and is safe where it's needed. Uh, we should change the irrational rules which are undermining both of those objectives. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. I call Miles Briggs to be followed by Colin Smith. Mr. Briggs, please. Deputy President Officer, um, I'd also like to congratulate uh, Rona Mackay on securing this evening's debate and also to congratulate her for the campaigning which she's undertaken in this area uh, since she was elected. The 2011 change, which was initiated by the UK government's advisory committee on the safety of blood, tissues and organ, was a welcome step forward. But in looking at it now, it looks like just a small step forward. And I recognise that many men who have sex with men, including many gay couples in long-term monogamous relationships, and who want to donate blood, remain deeply disappointed and frustrated that they are still unable to do so. As Patrick Harvey has mentioned, Today we have seen advances in technology and testing and I think all of us can agree that it's the right time to look again at this matter with the aim that blood donation would be under a risk assessment being carried out as is currently the case with organ, stem cell and bone marrow donations. I'm very sympathetic to the suggestion that sexual behaviour and not sexual orientation should be the determining, determining factor for whether someone can donate blood and that in, individual risk-based assessments are thus more appro uh, appropriate than a blanket ban approach. I welcome the fact that the UK Government's Advisory Committee has initiated a new review of the policy in this area and I think we all look forward to those conclusions to be able to move this issue forward. A number of other uh, developed nations, including our European partners in Italy and Spain, do not discriminate on the basis of sexual orient orientation, but rather use the individual risk assessment approach. And I think we should look at how they manage their systems of blood donations in a safe and effective manner and see what we can learn from these countries. I also want to take this opportunity, as others have, to say thank you to those who actually work in our Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service and all the blood donors, not only in my Lothian region, but across Scotland for literally the life-saving contribution they make. They really do help to save lives and, they, and, they, and we must do all we can to support them and encourage more people to come forward and donate blood. Last Friday, I met with a local cancer charity in my region who informed me that on average, patients with leukemia commonly require up to eight units of blood or blood products every day during treatment um, for weeks at a time. It's estimated that 18 blood donors are required to provide the blood required for just one leukemia patient undergoing a month's treatment. 
It's therefore a real concern that the Scottish, blood, the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service has said that the number of new donors in Scotland has declined by 30% in the last five years. Statistics show that whilst 96% of new donors are under the age of 55, the Blood Transfusion Service is increasingly reliant on these donors over 55 to make sure there is always enough blood for patients with less than 4% of the eligible, po eligible population in Scotland actually being active blood donors, we need to look at new and imaginative ways of getting more people to become active blood donors. In responding to the debate, I would be interested if the Minister would also outline the Scottish Government's position with regards to people who've had blood transfusions who are also currently excluded from donating blood, as this is another potential large group in our society who would, be, who would very much like to give blood, and I think that's an area we also need to look um, and, and move forward on. To conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, I again welcome today's debate and recognise the cross-party support that exists for a better assessment a policy in this area. And I hope that working together, I believe we can introduce a system and I look forward to progress being made to implement this. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Call Colin Smith, to be followed by Jamie Green. And Jamie Green will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Smith, please. Th thank you very much, President Officer. And can I begin by commending Rona Mackay for bringing this important motion to the Chamber today and for the work she and many groups across Scotland have done to raise our awareness of this important issue. I think all members are in agreement that the absolute priority for blood donations is ensuring that we do have a safe and a reliable supply of blood for those who need it. This means having enough blood to meet demand and it means ensuring with confidence that the blood supply available to the public is free from infection and disease. But current trends in Scotland show that the number of registered blood donors has fallen by 30% since 2011. And at present, only 4% of the eligible population aged between 17 and 70 are registered to donate blood. In preparing for this evening's debate, I checked the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service's current stock levels, and it showed that current stocks of O-negative blood are below the service's six-day supply target. We owe a real debt of gratitude to those who do donate blood, but it's, in, it's clear that more needs to be done to encourage those who aren't already blood donors to sign up and to give blood on a regular basis. The safety of that blood supply is, of course, of paramount importance. But as we've heard in the debate this evening, the current rules are not focused on that supply being safe, and they were introduced in 2012 which place a 12-month blanket deferral period for blood donations from men who have sex with men. A reduction of the previous lifetime deferral introduced in the 1980s, but it simply does not go far enough. The previous policy was born from a fear of the, the transmission of HIV and other infections to those receiving donated blood. And the severity of those concerns cannot be downplayed. Since 2001, we have seen the rates of HIV cases in Scotland rise annually from the previous decade. Health Protection Scotland have calculated, for example, that 372 cases were reported in 2014. But of course, the rise in numbers can be attributed to many factors, including an increase in the number of people coming forward to get tested. Thanks to scientific advances with the right treatment, it is now possible for someone living with HIV to have a normal and healthy life expectancy if they are tested early and that treatment begins as soon as possible. And it's scientific advanta mm -hmm. advances that mean it is now appropriate to review the policy of a 12-month deferral period for blood donations from the S MSM community and consider a new non-discriminatory mm -hmm. risk assessment in line with organ, stem cell and bo bone marrow donations. We know that testing is now, as Patrick Harvey said, far more accurate than ever before. The current nucleic acid testing carried out on all blood donations can detect HIV in the blood after nine days, a shorter window period than, for example, hepatitis B and syphilis. It's clear that blood donation services accept that specific behaviours rather than someone's sexuality determines the risk of infection. A man who has sex with one man in the past 12 months is likely to have a lower risk than many who are allowed to donate blood, including men and women who have unprotected sex with different partners. If we make the assumption that gay people are more promiscuous than heterosexuals, you make the same mistake as those who regarded HIV and AIDS as only a condition that affected mm -hmm. gay men. The issue raises, raises the question, in light of the 2010 Equality Act, 
whether or not it is unlawful to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation in this case because it is the provision of a good or service, and whether the current rules are indeed lawful is an important factor we have to consider. The Act does state that a donation can be lawfully refused if it is based on scientific evidence, but it is becoming increasingly clear that the scientific evidence does not make it reasonable to refuse donations simply on the basis of a blanket ban. Therefore, Labour very much welcomes the motion that is before mm -hmm. the Chamber today. As Rona Mackay says, the current rules are archaic. They do not promote equality. And continuing to exclude people who may be able to donate threatens a, su a sufficient supply of blood, something one in four of us will rely, rely on at some point in our lives. Thank you very much. I call Jamie Green. <coughs> uh, sorry, also, first of all, I too would like to join other members in congratulating uh, Rona Mackay on securing this uh, important debate. Uh, blood must be available quite simply 24-7 throughout Scotland, uh, and that includes remote areas of Scotland too. But blood has a very short shelf life and cannot be stockpiled. Uh, uh, therefore, every day NHS Scotland depends on donors to help maintain those stock levels. As Colin Smith has just said, uh, the number of uh, new donors has uh, fallen by 30% in just five years, and less than 4% of the eligible population are active blood donors. It is also important to note in this debate that funding for Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service has fallen by 16% since 2010, and I hope that's something that the Minister will uh, also uh, heed and take into account. Uh, I think we're in uh, absolute agreement that there is a need to encourage new people to, uh, to give blood, and I think there's a whole generation, really, of Scots who don't remember the uh, Rowan Atkinson talking to a stone TV adverts that I recall uh, as a as a child and, and the effect that had on me and, and the importance of the matter. So I think that we, we, we now need to think about how we uh, encourage new people to, um, uh, to give blood. On this specific debate, at a time when it's so critical uh, that uh, we um, need more blood, I think we cannot afford to exclude any potential donors unjustly. In my view, and I share the view from across the chamber that men who have, who have sex with men should not be prevented from donating blood based on their sexual orientation alone, but on their individual risk as assessed by a healthcare professional. There is little chance of a potential donor of any sexual orientation being allowed to donate blood if they're not entirely fit to do so. In fact, just yesterday I had a meeting in uh, Inverclyde Royal Hospital with some uh, nurses who work in blood-borne viruses, and they were telling me that actually the uh, cases of um, heterosexual HIV infection is uh, going up. So I think there's a huge amount of misconception around uh, uh, gay men and blood donation. Um, improvements in testing and many other safeguards have reduced the risk to an acceptable level. Uh, due to the drop in donors that I mentioned, we face a shortage. Right now in Scotland, there are only six days supply of blood type B uh, negative, for example and just seven days supply of A+. Plus. So this is a, a real problem if you are in need of blood and in one of those blood groups or if you're involved in an accident or have an operation coming. So this it really is affecting people in Scotland today. I'm sure we all agree that it is in it, our interest not to just prevent healthy people from donating blood, but <clears throat> if the scienti scientific evidence tells us they do not pose a risk, we should allow them to do so. Uh, from a personal point of view, uh, I am a card-carrying organ donor, but I have never given blood. And I guess a lot of that comes down to some of the issues that Patrick Harvey raised around uh, the stigma of going and having that very difficult and private discussion about your uh, sexual practices. Um, I think uh, we must make sure that our policies are based on scientific evidence and in the best interests of the public. I absolutely welcome uh, this new Sabto policy review I, heed, uh, I, I hope the, the UK and Scottish governments uh, uh, try to implement any recommendations that come out of it. Uh, we should remember that the regulation of blood donation keeps us all safe, but it should also keep us all equal. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Maureen Watt to wind up for the Government. Minister, up to seven minutes, please. 
Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, unfortunately, the Minister for Public Health and Sport is not able to be here today, but having held the post and uh, having considered this issue, I'm uh, happy to be here to speak on this important issue. And I'd like to thank all those members who have contributed to this important debate. I welcome the intentions that this motion reflects. Of course, we want to ensure that the NHS has sufficient blood to meet demand. So I too want to thank the many thousands of people who come forward to give blood every year. Demand for blood has actually reduced by 20% over recent years, but we continue to ask for new donors to replace uh, older ones who perhaps dropped off and to, because we need to get donations from people with certain types of blood. So anyone wishing to join the, or, uh, the, the register is very welcome indeed. This motion talks about equality and this government takes equality very seriously. However, this issue is not a matter of equality or deliberate discrimination. It's a matter of the safety of the blood supply. So, presiding officer, I'd like to explain the rationale for the current restrictions that are in place. I know that some men who have sex with men feel they're being unjustly prevented from donating blood, but this deferral is based on current epidemiology and a scientific assessment of risk. The Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service has a clear duty to minimise the risk of a blood transfusion transmitting any infection. I think when we go to give blood, we're all asked the same questions on the same questionnaire. If we take in 2015, for example, around 25,000 potential donors were deferred for various reasons. 31 of these were men who have sex with men. The rest were deferred for the other reasons, including people who have traveled to certain countries, people who have recently had a tattoo, people who take certain medications of, or have certain illnesses. So pe people are not deferred on the basis of sexual orientation, but on the basis of high risk behaviors. Patrick Harvey. I'm <coughs> grateful to the minister for giving way. Doesn't that low figure suggest that as, as many of us during the debate suggested, a great many uh, people who identify as men in same-sex relationships, uh, stable monogamous same-sex relationships, just don't turn up. These are potentially valuable blood donors uh, whose, whose blood is not at any risk because of their uh, sexual activity, who are just not turning up to offer blood in the first place. Minister? Well, I'm not sure if there are any figures of people who have turned up um, uh, uh, and not giving blood uh, in the first place, but I think... Uh, everyone will agree that the, the safety is paramount. The deferral of men who've had sex with men is based on two facts. Firstly, they are at significantly higher risk of HIV than other groups. And secondly, it's not always possible to detect the, pre the presence of infections in donated blood. From Health Protection Scotland data, we know that in Scotland, the prevalence rate of HIV amongst men who have sex with men is 7.7%. In heterosexual individuals, that figure is 0.07%. So men who have sex with men are some 100 times more likely to be infected with HIV than others. Of course, monogamous relationships and the use of condoms does reduce the transmission of HIV and other infections, but it cannot eliminate, eliminate the risk altogether. Approximately 30% of men who have sex with men who are infected with HIV are unaware of their infection. This would not represent such a significant risk if it was possible to always detect HIV infection in donated blood. The latest tests are very sensitive, but they're not perfect. Certain infections, including HIV, have what's called a window period immediately after infection, infection where they're not yet detectable. The last two transfusion-related transmission of HIV in the UK were as a, as a result of this window period. This is not purely a theoretical risk, and this is why the deferral is currently recommended. The motion makes specific reference to the donation of organs and cells. However, it's important to understand why the criteria for these donations are different. 
For example, there is a limited supply of organs, and in these cases, cases the recipient will often be in a life or death situation. The life-saving benefit of a transplant will often outweigh the potential risk of HIV or other serious infections, so the risk assessment differs. This is not the case for blood donations, as a blood transfusion always has sufficient blood available to meet demand, so they don't need to take the risks. Decisions about the criteria for donating blood are based on the best sci available scientific evidence. This is complex technical work, so we follow the advice of the Expert Advisory Committee on the safety of blood tissues and organ donations, as others have mentioned, known as SABTO. SABTO has set up a working group to review the donor selection criteria and, as has been already mentioned, it will report next year. The Cabinet Secretary for Health wrote to SABTO earlier this year to encourage them to give consideration to other methods of managing the risk to the blood supply, including looking at other models of individualised assessment of donor risks. This review is welcome because it's assessing the latest evidence and considering different approaches to blood safety. The working group is also engaging with groups that may be affected by its recommendations, including organisations who represent men who have sex with men. The advice from SABTO is not static. They previously recommended a change in policy in 2011, which has been implemented. So, presiding officer, I'm grateful to be able to explain, to provide the government's position on this issue, to explain the good reasons for the current policy, but also to provide reassurance that this continues to be under review. It is also important to reflect the historic experience of those who were infected with serious viruses such as HIV or Hep C as a result of NHS blood and blood products. The Penrose inquiry on this was published last year. And having met many families involved at the time of publication of a report, the report, I know that those affected would feel strongly that blood safety should never be compromised and any risks should be mitigated as far as possible. This is what our current deferral policies seek today to do based on expert advice. One inadvertent infection via blood would be one too many. It would have lifelong consequences for those affected and could have a detrimental effect on the trust in the blood transfusion service and the wider NHS. We will seriously consider any recommendations from the review. Yep. Can, I, can I say to the member, I will let you intervene. It's a very serious and important debate, but it helps if you intervened earlier. I knew you were thinking about it for a long time. I've anyway, there you go. Well, just whilst I agree with the Minister that safety is of paramount importance, does she not agree with me that um, risk should be based on sexual behaviour rather than orientation? Minister. Well, I think that's absolutely what I've said throughout <coughs> my speech. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I, that's absolutely what I've said throughout my speech about the... the um, the high risk of certain behaviours, not on social, uh, uh, not on sexual orientation. I hope that made that absolutely clear. But I hope that, having said what I've said, that members also understand why the current deferrals are in place. Of course, if Sabto come up with recommendations that we change that, that will be considered at the time. But I hope I set out the current position. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, especially stepping in for, for a colleague. And thank you for a very serious and thoughtful debate from all members. Uh, that concludes the debate, and I now close this meeting of Parliament.